Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar. We are thrilled to have a guest speaker uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on your time zone, um, Dr. Natalie Perse Dessert uh, from NC3RS is going to be talking to us about the experimental design assistant tool. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it off to Natalie. Hi, thank you, Gartney. Um, okay, so well, this webinar is about the Experimental Design Assistant, or EDA for short, which is a freely available online software which was developed by the NT3Rs to guide researchers in the planning and analysis of animal experiments. Um, so I think I've got a one-hour slot, and I'm going to start by providing a bit of background to explain who we are and why we develop such a resource. Then I'll present the EDA itself and what you can do with it. Um, and then I'll do a demonstration of it. Um, and that should still leave us plenty of time for questions if you've got any. So I'm going to start by introducing um, the NTFRs just to give you an idea of where we're coming from. So the NTFRs is an independent scientific organization which was funded, which is funded primarily by the UK government. Um, and we lead on the discovery and application of new technologies and approaches to replace, reduce, and refine the use of animals in research and testing. So that's traditionally known as the three R's. Partnership is key to everything that we do. So we work with um, scientists and organizations across the life sciences sector, and that includes other funders, the universities, regulators, um, journals, and the pharmaceutical, chemical, and consumer product industries. Um, most of our money goes into funding research, so we're the primary funder of three hours research in the UK. But we also have in-house program of work, which are led by the scientists in the office. And we've been running a program on experimental design for many years. Um, our perspective is that an experiment which doesn't yield robust results, for example, because it's underpowered or because the risk of bias have not been addressed, is a waste of animal use and it's unethical. Um, not to mention the implications when an entire program of clinical work is based on the findings of animal research as well. So the two main resources that have been developed as part of that program are the RAV guidelines, which were developed to improve the reporting of animal research. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the RAV guidelines today. So if you want to find more information, you can just go to the link um, ntfrs.org.uk slash RAV guidelines. Um, and the, the second one is the EDA, so the Experimental Design Assistant, which was developed to improve the design and analysis of in vivo experiments. And those two resources are pretty much complementary. So just to give you um, a bit of background um, about the, the reproducibility issue. So the reproducibility of preclinical research is very much a topical issue. A lot of um, ma uh, major scientific organizations are concerned about it and are trying to address it. Um, and I'd like to talk about two publications which I think really started the, the momentum and, and reproducibility. So these two papers report the findings of in-house validation studies from Bayer Healthcare and Amgen. So these were published in um, 2011 and 2012. Um, and basically, before embarking on big transitional efforts, most pharma will try to reproduce in-house um, interesting findings that they see in literature. So these uh, validation studies can take like six months to a year, and they put a lot of effort into it. And the issue is that in most cases, the published findings could not be reproduced in-house. Um, so something like 10 to 20 percent of the studies could be reproduced. Um, and in the case of Amgen, they did not um, only base their efforts on publications. They were actually in touch with investigators. In some instances, actually tried to reproduce the findings in the same labs that the original findings had been obtained from and still could not reproduce. So there's obviously a massive problem. Um, and there are many factors um, or, or many reasons for which findings might not be reproduced, but things like experimental design and reporting have been flagged as major concerns. Um, and we also looked at the quality of animal research when we started a program on experimental design. Um, and we, we carried out a survey of the um, publicly funded research in the US and in the UK. Um, and we looked at experiments involving rats, mice, and non-human primates. 
and we found significant scope for improvement in experimental design, um, in the way that experiments were being conducted, the way they were being analysed and the way they were being reported. So for example, in terms of design, we found that very few publications reported the use of randomization or blinding. None of the publications um, described how the sample size was chosen. In terms of the analysis, only 70% of the publication described the statistical method that was used and reported the results with a measure of precision or viability. So that means that a third of the publications were actually missing the minimum information necessary to understand the results. Um, and then in terms of reporting, we looked at a wide range of things. We looked at how the experiments were being described, the animal characteristics, and we found, for example, that a quarter of the publication reported neither the weight or the age of the animal that we used. Um, so we found significant scope for improvements, and these findings are by no means isolated. Virtually every study that's looked at the quality of animal research has found the quality wanting. So we started thinking about what we could do to improve standards um, in, in design and reporting of animal research, and we published the RAP guidelines. And after that, we decided to develop a system called the Experimental Design Assistant to guide researchers to the design of animal experiments. Um, so the EDA is a web application with a supporting website. Um, and the target audience is anyone that uses animals in their research. It was developed as a collaboration between in vivo researchers and statisticians from academia and industry, and a team of software designers specialized in expert systems. Um, so it's been extensively tested by researchers and statisticians, and you can access it freely um, on the link um, below um, edia.ntrs.org.uk. So what does the EDA do? Um, so the first thing is that the EDA gives you the ability to build a stepwise visual representation of an experiment. So that's what we call the EDA diagram. So for the EDA, we've developed an ontology to allow any experiment to be represented as one of these diagrams. And then these diagrams are machine readable. Um, so you can think of the ontology as um, Lego bricks, for example, um, and you can combine the bricks in any way that you want and you can represent any experiment that you want. Um, so this might be um, a novel approach and it might take a little time to get used to it. But for example, this is a very simple two group comparison and I'm going to talk you through it. So in this experiment, a pool of animal is split in two. Group one gets a vehicle injection, group two gets a drug injection. And then a measurement is taken, in this case plasma glucose levels are measured, and the data is analysed. The independent variable of interest is the drug with two levels, vehicle and drug. So each of these colourful things um, are called nodes, and each node contain more information. So these are the properties of the allocation nodes. So in there you can indicate your randomization strategy, in this case a complete randomization or your randomization procedure, whether you're going to do it by flipping a coin or you're going to use the spreadsheet that's generated from the EGA. Um, so the diagrams are a lot more explicit than text descriptions. So inside each of these nodes, you get more information uh, providing details about that specific step in the experiment. Um, and um, if, you think of, um, if you think of blinding, for example, in a text description, the best that you can get is the experiment was done blind. And you've got no idea how, like, who was blinded to what, what step of the experiment was done blind. In the EDA diagram, you can get the blinding status in the properties of the allocation, measurement, and analysis nodes. So for each step of the process, you know exactly who's blinding to what. And the granularity here is very important because Animal experiments have constraints, and you might not be able to blind every step of the process. Um, for example, if you're working with lean and obese rats, there's no way that you could blind the measurement step. There's, you know, you're always going to be able to tell which ones of the rats are obese and which ones are lean. Um, but there's no reason that you shouldn't blind the analysis stage, for example. Um, so it's about providing more transparency around the experimental plan. Um, so in the ETA, every experiment is represented by one of these diagrams. Um, and the, the diagrams are actually in three parts. So the grey nodes provide high-level information about the experiment. Um, so um, in there you'll find information about your hypothesis, your effect of interest, the animal characteristics, experimental units, and so on. The blue and purple nodes um, provide information about the, the practical steps. So these are the practical steps in the lab. So you've got groups and they're divided, and then they're subjected to interventions, measurements, and so on. And then the green and the pink nodes are about the analysis and the variables included in the analysis. 
Um, and if you've never used the system before, um, it might seem quite difficult to come up with your own diagram. Um, so we've actually included a lot of help in the system. So we've included examples. So in there you can find text description and um, the corresponding diagram representation so you can see how different features are represented as diagrams. We've also included templates. So you can actually load the templates as a starting point and you can customize it. You can remove groups, add groups, remove interventions and so on just to make it represent the experiment that you want to do. Um, we've also included um, definitions about each of the nodes that are in the palette. So if you don't know what we mean by outcome measure, for example, you can open the information box and in there you'll find what the outcome measure is also known as, uh, what the outcome measure is, is, a definition of it, common examples of um, outcome measures that are seen in animal experiments and so on. So that's, that's just going to help you recognize what it is that you're working with in your experiment. Um, and I'll talk about the feedback feature in a lot more detail later, but you can actually use the feedback to build your diagram. So you could just put the practical steps that you're going to do in the lab, critique your experiment, get feedback from the system, and the system will help you identify the rest info of the information and build the rest of the diagram. Um, and we've also included video tutorials. Um, so you can find tutorials on how to create a diagram, how to critique it, um, how to drag nodes and connect them and so on. Right, so the, um, the second thing that the DA does is that it provides, um, it provides feedback on your experimental plan. So once you've built your diagram, you can critique it and you get feedback from the system. Um, so that feedback is actually uh, based on a data set of rules that we've, um, we've included in the back end of the system. And the EDA uses computer-based logical reasoning to do this. So the feedback could come in different shapes and forms. Um, so you could get feedback, for example, on the diagram structure. So if the system does not understand your diagram, then you'll um, basically get feedback to help you bring it to a state that both you and the system understand. The feedback could ask you to provide more information. So this would be an example of a prompt asking you to specify whether the outcome measure is continuous or categorical. So in there, you'll find information as to what is continuous and categorical data, uh, common examples of continuous and categorical data, and the implication of working with each type of data. So that should give you enough information for you to make an informed decision and decide what you want to work with in your experiment. That's another example of a prompt asking for more information, asking you to indicate the blinding stages during the assessment of the outcome. So in there, you'll find information as to why blinding is important, the different stages of the experiments that can be done blind, and the different ways that you can blind different stages of the experiment. Um, the feedback could also point out inconsistencies, for example, detect that two variables are completely confounded. It could prompt you to consider things that are not in the diagram. So for example, other sources of viability that ought to be considered um, in an animal experiment and um, included in the design of the, um, the experiment. Um, it could prompt you to highlight the implication of some of the choices that you've made. So for example, you've, you're measuring your animal at different time points and you've included time as a variable in the analysis, that means that you're actually interested in the difference between each of the time points. If you're not, then the system will suggest um, alternative method of analysis and, and ways that you could simplify the analysis. Um, and then, so once the system has helped you identify all your variables, then it will provide a suggestion for a method, a method of analysis that's compatible with your diagram and that's based on the number of variables and the type of variable that you've included in your recording. Um, and the, so the rule set will be expanded over time. So at the minute we've got around 140 rules in the system, but we're going to expand this um, so that we can provide more feedback and more detailed feedback um, and maybe identify more subtle issues that could lead to problems. Another thing that the EDA does, it provides support for randomization, blinding, and sample size calculation. So there are a couple of sample size calculators in the system. Um, there's nothing um, unusual about them. These are the type of calculators that you can find easily online. But where most of the work has gone is into the guidance, how, how you, uh, the guidance on how to use them um, and how to identify 
each of the parameters that you need to input into the power calculation. So we've got loads of guidance in there that you can use. And then once you know how many animals you need per group, um, the system can generate the randomization sequence for you. Um, and it will actually not give it to you. It'll send it to the person that's helping you with the blinding so that you can remain unaware of the group allocation for the duration of the experiment. Um, and the, um, the website also contains a lot of information um, around experimental design. So even if you're not using the app, you can still refer to the website for a trusted source of information on experimental design. So in there you can find information on sample size calculation, for example, and when and how to use standardized effect sizes, or on method of analysis like data transformation, multiple testing corrections, and so on. And the diagrams really improve the communication around experimental design. These are explicit descriptions of your experimental plan. So you can keep this for your own records. Um, I mean, it's always handy to um, have an explicit description of what you did when you come to publish your experiment three years down the line. Um, or you can, um, you can use them to get feedback um, from you know, your, your colleagues or a PhD um, student, for example, could use this to get feedback from the supervisors. So this would be um, the workflow when you're using the system. So you first start by drawing a diagram, then you add details into the node properties, you critique your diagram, get feedback from the system, and you will go through these first three stages several times until you're actually happy with your design. Um, then you can choose a method of analysis and the system will help you with that. You can calculate your sample size, generate your randomization sequence, and send it to the person that's gonna help you with the blinding. You can share your diagram as well. So you can share your experimental plans with um, uh, another EDA user. Uh, you can actually do this at any stage of, this, uh, of the process. Um, soon you'll be able to export a diagram report. So that functionality is not in the system yet. We're currently developing it. Um, but basically that will be a report that contains key information about your experiment um, and an image of your diagram. And that happens to be exactly the information that uh, the major funders in the UK want to see in grant applications. So the idea is to help you provide this information in a standardized format uh, without, without having to uh, repeat that information into your grant application. Uh, and then hopefully you get funded and you can carry out the experiment. And then you can go back and update the diagram. Some of the fields can be edited afterwards. Um, for example, the number of animals that you ended up analyzing might be different from the numbers that you planned on having because you've had some unexpected attrition. So you can actually go back and update the number that was actually analyzed with a reason as to why that number is different from the numbers that you planned on having. So that you can keep an accurate um, description of your experiment. So why would you use the EDA? Um, so the first thing is to improve the reliability of published results. So the EDA will help you by addressing obvious sources of bias in your experiment. Um, the EDA also promotes better understanding of the experimental design and more awareness by why these issues are important. So every time you get feedback from the system, you actually learn something new. The EDA is not a black box telling you how to do things. It basically, um, highlight the implications of doing things certain ways so that you can make an informed decision. Um, the EDA also facilitates the assessment of the experimental plan with an explicit description. So that can be at the level of the grant application, the ethical review process, um, manuscript submission, or even for, journal, for readers of a journal, um, so that everyone's got access to all the information that they need to have access to about the experiment. And then that, that can also be used as a form of pre-registration. So you can register your diagram that's got the entire experimental plan um, and you can provide that as evidence that you've not changed your primary outcome measure, for example, when you got the results. Um, and with the EDA, we really want to promote a more careful consideration of the experimental plan. So we want researchers to spend more time planning their experiment. Um, and that's on purpose. I mean, I often get asked how long it takes to uh, run an experiment through the EDA. Um, and to be honest, if you know exactly what you're going to do, you've identified all your variables, you know exactly how the experiment's going to be done, it only takes 10 minutes to put it through a system. That's not what takes time. What takes time is getting feedback from the system and considering that feedback and changing your plans and maybe discussing it further with your lab. Um, and that will take a fair amount of time, but that's, that's on purpose. Um, I mean, it's much better to spend that time now rather than after data collection, it's just too late to change anything. 
Um, and the diagrams really facilitate discussion. So I've got anecdotal evidence that they are used at lab meetings. And, and the fact that you know, having a diagram on screen to discuss your plan is really, really helpful because everyone is, is very clear as to how this experiment is going to be done. It's very clear how many groups are going to be in this experiment, what the variables are going to be, what reasons variable you're considering, how you're going to incorporate that into the design, um, you know, what data transformation you're going to be using. And you can have a meaningful discussion about all these things. Um, and that means that you get an opportunity to actually optimize your plans before doing the experiment. So the EDA can be used in different ways by different users. So the core users are the people that we had in mind when we designed the resource. So these are in vivo researchers, primarily in academia with no or very little access to training or statistical support. So these people would mainly benefit from using the EDA app itself and, and design their experiments in the EDA. But then there's a whole bunch of secondary users who are very interested in the EDA. And these are experts in peer researchers, statisticians, regulators, funders, and journals. Um, so all these um, users would not benefit from using the app, but they want to see the output of the app. They want to see the diagrams that have been generated by the researchers. Um, and and that, that's going to be really helpful for them to actually see this and have access to this information. So that's all I have in terms of slides. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions now if there are any questions. Um, so yes, no. questions come in. Um, so somebody asked, is there any reason this would not be suitable for use in the social sciences, e.g. Uh, economic field experiments? Yeah. So, um, so they, so we designed this resource for animal experiments, but the principle actually um, are relevant across the board. So it, it's actually the same principle for any type of experiment. Uh, the risk of bias is going to be the same. Um, the only um, thing that I'd say is that basically all the feedback that the system provides, all the information that we provide on the website is geared towards animal experiment, which means that you can get examples about, you know, type of variables that are common in, in animal experiments. We're going to be talking about, you know, cages as a variable, that kind of thing. So obviously that's not going to be relevant to other research fields, uh, but the principle are the same. So you just have to take that with a pinch of salt and try to interpret it if you wanted to use it for a different research field. Um, so Ruby asked, is there a timeline for when the export diagram um, report functionality will be available? Um, so it should be available very, very soon. Um, so next couple of months at least that will be available. Uh, it's nearly ready. We're just doing final testing on it. Great. And then I actually had a follow up question uh, to you mm -hmm. about uh, using the design tool for non animal experiments. Um, obviously, you could just kind of ignore some of the feedback that's related to variables related to animals. Um, but are there any kind of longer term plans to um, make a variant or, you know, give variable feedback where somebody could select, hey, I'm actually doing human research? Um, so, so basically, developing a variant for human research wouldn't fall within the remit of the NT3Rs because we, we are, our remit is animal research. Um, but there's no reason that this couldn't be done, and we'd be happy to collaborate with anyone that actually wants to do this and, and provide as much support as possible. Um, so if anyone is interested, then that could be doable. All right, great. Um, so uh, we had another question. Can the tool be used to carry out studies without doing lab experiments? Um, so I'm not sure what that refers to. Um, and um, so you could actually do, um, you could actually represent an observation study into the EDA. There's no reason that you can't represent this. Um, obviously, if this is not a lab setting, if you're not randomizing animals into groups, then the feedback that the EDA will provide might not be as relevant. Um, but you could still represent it as a diagram um, and, and use the, you know, they have an explicit description that you can use to communicate with your peers and colleagues. So you could still put them through the EDA. Um, it's just that the feedback that the EDA provides is geared towards internal um, validity. So an observational study actually would probably gain very little from the EDA feedback. Great. Right. 
Um, so Ross asked, do you envision that funding bodies will require pre-registration of EDA experimental designs for proposed research? So, well, in the UK, um, main funders like the MRC and actually ourselves, the NCFRs, recommend that our grant holders use the EDA um, to prepare the grant application. We are not making it compulsory on purpose. We don't think that it should be compulsory. Um, you know, different people might have different ways of doing it. As long as we see the experimental design information that we request in grant application, then people can provide it in any way that they want. Um, so using the EDA will actually help them because that actually will save time for them. Uh, but if they want to provide this information um, in any other way, then we would not force them to use the EDA. And I think it should not be made mandatory. Okay. Um, is there a cost to using the tool? No, it's free to use. Anyone can use it. Um, and then somebody asked, um, um, does the EDA feedback feature provide comments on all stages of the workflow? Um, so I'm referring to the EDA workflow diagram. I'm wondering which steps it is available to assist with. So, Right, the workflow diagram. Um, well, the feedback was actually one step in the workflow diagram. Um, so the, the EDA feedback specifically provide feedback on the, on the plans and then provide a suggestion for a method of analysis. So that's what the feedback does. That's part of the workflow, basically. All right. Um, and then let's take uh, one more question and then move into the demonstration. And then there will be time um, at the end to also answer questions as well. Um, so Julian asked, um, is there a way to export all the experimental settings um, in order to share them? Or do people only, um, or is the only way to view the, the EDA through the EDA portal? Right, okay. So at the minute, you will need to read a diagram in the EDA. So there's different ways that you can share a diagram in the EDA. Um, and I'll show that in the demonstration. You can you can just share it with you know using an email address, um, and that means that that person will have access to your experiment in the experiment list, or you could download the entire um, diagram data and save that locally. Um, but then, if you want to view it, you're going to have to upload it back into the EDA. Um, so at the minute, that's the only way that you can do it. But as I said, anyone can register for an account and you only need to provide minimal information like an email address and a password to register for an account. All right, great. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the demonstration and then we'll have more time for questions at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna try to switch to my Chrome. All right, can, can everyone see this? Yep. So, okay, so I mean, this is, so this is the homepage when you first get to the EDA. Um, so if you, if you go to eda.ncfrs.org.uk, that's where you get to. Um, so in there, you can see um, just some more information about what the EDA is uh, and a very summarized workflow and like how you'd work with this. And then if you want to access the app, um, you can access it via that tab here, EDA app. Um, and I'm actually going to make that full screen so that you can always see it. Um, so, you, well, if you've never used it, you'd have to register for an account, but then you can just log in. And then when you log in, you will get to your um, experimental list, your experiment list, sorry. Um, so in my experiment list is quite full because I've been using the system forever. Um, but um, if you first, if you've never used it before, the only thing that you're going to find in your experiment list are the templates and the examples. Um, and then as you start using it, then your own experiment will start populating that list. Um, so you can actually filter that list. Um, so you can actually use keywords in the title or in the type of experiment that if you want to look for a specific experiment. And you can also, um, you can also order um, the, um, the different experiments according to the dates that were created, modified, and so on. Um, so I'm going to go ahead uh, and create a new experiment. So you just click on that button here in the top right corner, new experiment. And that will take you to um, the canvas. Um, so that's the canvas where you can design your diagram. Um, 
so I'm just going to start by showing you the help menu. Um, so in there you can find information about the general process. So that's a useful reminder of what, you know, the steps that you need to go through when you're using the EDA. So that's a, a summary of the workflow that I showed earlier. So you need to start by drawing a diagram, add detail in the node properties, critique your diagram to get feedback, choose an analysis method, calculate your sample size, um, and generate your randomization sequence and so on. Um, oops, that window's moved. I don't know if I'm going to be able to close it. Uh, I'm going to close this. Oh, there it is. Um, and then in the help menu, um, you can also uh, find the user guide. So that will send you back to the website. So you can find a, a complete user guide. You can also access the examples from the help menu as well and the video tutorials. Um, and then you can access, you can actually load the templates directly onto a blank canvas. Um, so if you hover over the different templates, you get a brief description. So the first one would be a two-group comparison. Um, this one would be a crossover design and so on. So you can actually load the template to start with. But for the purpose of the demonstration, I'm just going to start by drawing a diagram from scratch. But if you've never used it before, I highly recommend that you study the examples and you start with the template. Um, so starting from scratch, I'm just going to uh, reproduce the diagram that I showed earlier, the two-group comparison. Um, so on the left hand side you have the palette and that's where you find all the nodes that you can use to build your diagram. Um, and as you can see as I hover over the different nodes you get a little uh, blue icon and that's how you access the information box so you can access more information um, about each of the nodes in the palette. So for example here the independent value of interest you can access information and it will tell you what it is known as, what is the independent variable of interest, common examples of independent variable of interest in animal experiments. Um, so you start to start building in the diagram, um, you just drag and drop nodes into the canvas. Um, so I'm starting by dragging an experiment node in there. Um, and you can see that the node has red boundaries because it's not connected to anything yet. So anything that's disconnected will have red boundaries. Um, that little icon here, the little lines, actually give you access to the properties of that node. So if you click on this, that opens the properties. Um, and in there, you can enter information about the hypothesis, the effect of interest, the effect size, and, and the justification for effect size, and so on. So you can input all this information. Um, the red stars mean that the information is mandatory. So you're going to have to provide that information, otherwise you'll get feedback from the EDA. Um, it's not going to prevent you from using the system, but you will get feedback and you will get a reminder that you need to provide this information. Um, if you don't know, you know, if you don't know the hypothesis at this stage of the effect of interest, you can just leave it blank for now. And then when you critique your diagram, you'll get more information um, and you'd get help to identify this information. So don't try to guess. If you don't know, leave it blank and wait for the feedback. Um, and then, so that node is selected, and if you hover to the right of it, there's a little node menu. So basically, in that menu, you'll only see the nodes that you can connect to that node. So in this case, you can only connect the animal characteristics to the experiment node. So if you just click on this, that's going to add the animal characteristics node into your diagram and connect it automatically. Um, again, you've got properties of the animal characteristics and, and you can enter information about the species, the strain, the sex, the age, and so on. Um, if you've got different animal characteristics in your experiment, so let's say you're working with male and female rats, then you'd have to um, put two different nodes in there. So you'll have your animal characteristics for the male and then you just add a different node for the females. So you do it that way. Um, and then in terms of the practical steps that we're going to do in this experiment, um, so we, we've got a group, um, so that's the pool group. I'm just going to change the label. So I just double clicked on the node to um, change the label, pool group. Um, and then that group is going to be split into two. So I'm going to add an allocation um, and that group is allocated into two different groups, group one and two. And you can just drag the nodes to tidy up your diagram. Then each group is subjected to um, different pharmacological intervention. They were getting drug injections. So I'm going to add two different pharmacological interventions. And then a measurement is taken. Um, so I'm going to add a measurement node. Um, all animals are actually measured together. They're all getting the same measurement. So I'm going to connect that um, pharmacological intervention to that measurement node. So the way you do this is that you 
uh, hover to the right again, look at the node menu, select the measurement, and instead of clicking on it, you just drag it to the existing measurement node. And as you can see, um, green corners have appeared around the measurement node. That means that the collection is allowed. So you can just let go and that's just gonna create the connection. And you can just tidy up the diagram again. Um, if a connection is not allowed, then you'll get immediate feedback as well. So for example, if I was trying to subject my group of animal to another group, that doesn't make sense and the system will not actually allow this. So if I let go, nothing happens, basically. It's just not connected. The arrow is now disconnected. If I want to reconnect it to the pharmacology intervention, I can just do this um, and it reconnects automatically. Um, and then after, so my measurement was recorded as an outcome measure. So it was recorded as the um, glucose um, levels. And then the data was analyzed. So I'm just going to add an analysis note in there. Um, so I'm just going to leave it there, critique, and see what type of feedback the system gives us now. Um, if you want more space on the canvas, you can collapse the palette, and that gives you a little bit more set space. You can also um, zoom in and out. Um, so for example, you can zip to fit the model, and you've got your diagram full screen. Um, so we've got the results of the critique. So the feedback comes um, in the shape of icons. So you've got red icons, which are errors. And you've got these little yellow triangles, which are warnings. You can also get um, a blue circle. That means advice. So there's no advice on this one yet. We only have warnings and arrows. Um, and the way that you access the prompt is by just clicking on the icon. So I'm going to click on this arrow here on the experiment node. Um, and I've got two different errors. One telling me that the independent variable of interest is not specified. And another one is telling me that the experimental unit is missing. So you can access. Um, the information there. Um, so here you can find information related to the independent verbal of interest, what it is, common example of verbal of interest. Um, so for example, drug is a common example of independent verbal of interest. That's exactly what we're doing in this experiment, actually. Um, so we should add drug as an independent verbal of interest. I can just close that, close that prompt, close this, and then follow the advice, drag an independent verbal of interest into my diagram, call it drug um, and I've got two different categories um, I've got a vehicle and I've got the drug um, and so that's going to be included in my analysis so I'll just connect that variable to the analysis by dragging the analysis icon into the analysis node and that's automatically uh, connected as a factor of interest in the analysis. And then I can just go around my diagram and look for all the errors and try to address them. Um, so this one is about specifying whether the outcome measure is continuous or categorical. So you find information as to how to recognize this and the implications. Um, so you can close this, go to the properties and specify that this um, outcome measure, so plasma levels, um, are actually continuous. Um, you can ignore primary outcome measure because there's only one in this experiment, so you don't actually need to specify this. That's going to be primary by default. If you had a second one, you'd have to specify it. Um, what else did we have? Um, there was something about the experimental unit missing here. So you can open that prompt, read it, uh, find out about what the experimental unit is, how to recognize it, the different experimental units that you can come across in animal experiments. Um, so you can read all of this. In this case, we're giving animals injections. So the experimental unit is actually the animal. We can do that independently of other animals. So you can just add your experimental unit in there. So you add your notes and um, specify that the experimental unit is the animal. Um, what else? Um, there's another error here. So this one is telling us that the groups are not differentiated. So that's basically a prompt telling you that the system does not understand your diagram and that can't actually see the difference between group one and two. So you're going to have to indicate what is the difference between these two groups. And the way you do this is by tagging the interventions with the different variable categories. Um, so you can read this um, and then follow the advice and use the variable categories as tags on the intervention. So you select them by just going around them. You can do copy and paste using your normal keyboard shortcuts. 
um, and then you can indicate that this intervention is the vehicle and this one is the drug. Um, so we've actually tackled a fair bit of feedback, so I'm going to critique it again um, to see whether the, the feedback has evolved. So if you address the feedback, it will not automatically update. So if you want to get up-to-date feedback, you actually need to critique again. Um, I'm just going to zoom out a bit again. Um, so we've got a new feedback, and you can see that's different now. So we've got a new feedback on that independent verbal of interest that we added earlier. Um, so the feedback is that so we actually need to specify whether that's continuous or categorical and whether that's a repeated factor. So you can go and read the prompt there. Um, I'm just going to do it quickly for the purpose of the demonstration. So in this case, we've got a categorical independent verbal of interest, and that's not a repeated factor. Um, but if you read the prompt, you have one inclusion that you need to know to um, decide on this. Um, what else do we have in terms of feedback? Um, there's a warning on the experimental node here. Um, so we've not actually provided any information inside the node so far. So you get a lot of uh, feedback about information not provided. So FX size, effect of interest, um, null and alternative of processes are not provided. Um, this one is quite interesting. So other sources of viability are not accounted for in the design of this experiment. So you can read that, get more detail. Um, so basically, there, there are a lot of common um, reasons viable in any animal experiments, and you really need to consider it when you design your experiment. So there's a few examples of the type of viables that you should consider. Um, so you could read this and realize that, yes, actually that experiment is going to be done over two days because you can't process all the animals in one day. Um, so you could use that as a blocking factor. Um, so you can, there's a link for more information here. Um, so you can access more information on the website here. Yeah. But so you can decide to add a blocking factor in your experiment based on that feedback. So you open the, uh, the palette again and you can drag a reasons variable. Uh, and that's going to be the day of the experiment, and that experiment is going to be carried out over two days, so day one and day two. Um, and the advice was to include this as a blocking factor in the analysis. So you select the analysis icon, drag it to the analysis node, um, and as you can see, that's not created the link automatically. And the link is read as says unlinked. So that, that's because there's actually more than one possible relationship between the reasons variable and the analysis. So you need to select that link, hover on the red spanner, um, and specify what you want to do with that reasons variable. So in this case, you want this to be a blocking factor in the analysis because that's what the feedback said. Um, so you just select this, and, and that's going to indicate that it's a blocking factor in the analysis. Um, so we can try critiquing again and see whether the feedback has evolved. So we've got new feedback here. Um, there's a new error on this new nuisance variable that we've just added. Um, so it's telling us that the nuisance variable, if it's used as a blocking factor, that must be categorical. So you've got information to see um, you know, whether you really want to treat that reasons variable as a blocking factor, so you can actually read this and, and make up your mind. Um, and then if you don't and actually really want to treat this as continuous, for example, then these are the different suggestions that you could do with it and different ways that you could account for this variable in the design of the experiment. So in this case, we actually know that, you know, we actually want to treat this as categorical. There's no way that it could be continuous. Um, so you can specify this is categorical and you're going to account for this variable by blocking. Um, there's another warning here. Um, so a warning telling us that a blocking factor included in the analysis should also be included in randomization. So you can look for more information there. Um, and there you find information as to the implications of including a blocking factor in the analysis and, and why you should also include it in a randomization. Um, so you can read this and decide that you also want to include it in the randomization. Um, so you just go back to your nodes, select the allocation node, connect it. Um, and again, this is unlinked because there are more than uh, one possible way of linking it to the allocation. So you hover over the red spanner and you specify that this is a blocking factor for the allocation as well. 
Um, and if you want to tidy up your diagram um, so that the links just don't go across, you can actually bend the link. So you just go over the link until you see that little yellow dot. And then once you see it, you just click on it and drag the link um, and create a, a bend in the link. So I think we've tackled all the errors in that diagram. Um, so there are still quite a fair amount of warnings, but we're not going to go through this today. Um, so you can actually read that on your own time. Um, so now we can actually move in and ask the system to suggest a method of analysis that's compatible with this design. So if you've got any errors in the diagram, you won't do it, but we've now tackled all the errors. This one is actually tackled already. Um, so you can just ask for the system, ask the system to provide a, a method of analysis compatible with the design. So it's same print form, it'll take about 20 seconds. Um, and then you will see little icons on the analysis node. Um, so here it is, you've got a little green tick on the analysis node. So you can click on this. Um, and you can see that um, the system recommends, I mean, the system basically suggests that you could use a one-way ANOVA with blocking factors to um, analyze this experiment. So in this prompt, you'll find information uh, regarding the parametric assumptions, so the, the assumption of that particular analysis, um, and how you check that they meet the that your data meets the assumption, and then if it doesn't, you get advice regarding data transformation, um, so that you can make sure that you're not actually violating the assumptions, and then you will also get advice. Uh, or it's not advice; it's basically an example of a software that you could use to run this particular analysis. So you can use in vivo stats to run a one-way ANOVA with blocking factors. So in, in terms of um, examples of software, we've made sure that we've included either software that were very commonly used in animal um, labs or softwares that were freely available. So in vivo stats is an example of a freely available software which runs on R. Um, and which was specifically designed for animal experiments is quite easy to use. Uh, but obviously you could use any other type of software. This is just an example. Right, um, so I think that's it um, about the feedback that you could get on your diagram. Um, so other things that you can do with the system. Um, so there's the power calculation. So the power calculation tab is actually hidden when you start, but you can reveal it by just clicking on this little arrow here. Um, so that opens the power calculation tab. So you also have a notepad there. So you could actually um, you know, record notes around uh, about that experiment. Um, so you can type anything that you want, sorry, notes. Um, and you can save them. Just make sure you save them because the notes are not gonna be saved when you save the diagram. They're actually saved separately. So make sure that you save it. Um, and you get a confirmation saying save complete. And here's your power calculation tab. So as I said, there's only two different um, calculators in the ADA. Um, so those are very standard calculators for unpaired t-test and paired t-test. Um, but we've got loads of guidance, loads of guidance on how to use them. So you can access the full guidance here. So that takes you to the website where you can find information about you know, power analysis and what it actually does. Um, there's also a very handy decision tree to help you choose what power calculator you need to use because that's not that straightforward. Um, so you can actually go through the decision tree. And then there's, there's only three options in that decision tree. Either you're going to use uh, one of the two power calculators that are provided from the EDA um, app with, with all the guidance that we've got to help you identify the parameters or we recommend that you actually talk to a statistician um, because power calculations and identifying the, identifying the parameters for power calculations other than t-tests are actually quite complex and you need expert knowledge. Um, so we wouldn't recommend that you do it on your own if you don't actually have that knowledge. Um, and then if you scroll down, you've got information about the parameters. So how to identify your effect size, how to use coins D, um, how to identify the viability, and we've actually ranked this in order of kind of like the most reliable to the least reliable, depending on what information you've got access to. Um, and then the significance level, the power, uh, one sinus of the test, and the number of the group. Um, so let's just go back to the app now. Um, so you can just, you know, let's say, you know, in that experiment, um, so we are measuring plasma glucose levels. So let's say that you're interested in an effect size of two millimole per liter. 
and your, vi your viability is one. Um, so you can calculate the number of animals that you need per group. In this case, that's seven. So you can update your diagram. So in the properties of the groups, you can indicate that that group will contain seven animals. Um, and actually, n is seven because the number of experimental units is the same as the number of animals in this specific experiment. Um, you can do the same for the second group, seven animals and seven experimental units. All right, I'm just going to collapse the power calculation tab now. Um, so now that you know how many animals you need per group, you can actually um, generate the randomization sequence. Um, so if you click on this, that or you actually need to save your diagram first. Let's do that. Um, you cancel this. So save the diagram. Um, if you want to rename it, um, you can call it whatever you want. All right. Okay, save it. Um, and then, so generate your randomization sequence. So the system is going to help you, it's going to ask you for the email address of the person that you want to send that to. So that's the person that's going to be helping you with the blinding. Um, so I'm just going to send that to myself for the purpose of the demonstration. So just click OK. So the only thing that you're going to see as the, the user, the investigator, is a summary of what the randomization sequence contains. So in this case, it tells you that 16 animals have been randomized into two balance groups. Um, so the number of animals has been rounded up. We had seven per group. Um, it's actually randomized 16 in two groups because the idea only does, only does balanced randomization. So basically, we've randomized the same number of animals in each group on each day. So that's why we've rounded up to 16. Um, so that's all you have. And then um, I'm just going to show you what um, the person who received the randomization sequence will see. So I need to share um, Excel spreadsheet. So this is um, what the person will receive. They receive an email with the, an Excel spreadsheet. And in that spreadsheet, they've got the randomization sequence. So there's two different tabs for each day. So on day one, four animals have been randomized to each of the groups. And on day two, another four animals have been randomized to each of the groups. Um, so you've got eight animals on day one, eight animals on day two. So the person receiving that spreadsheet is going to have to input the unique animal identifier. Um, and then they'll either code the syringes for you or, or they'll, they'll inject the animals for you. Um, so that way you can remain unaware of the group allocation for the duration of the experiment. Um, so let me go back to um, Chrome. There it is. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, I mean, I've shown you most of the functionalities. Um, so on my system, I've got an icon for the report, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is not available yet. So you will not be able to see that icon if you're logged in right now. Um, and then I can just go through that menu quickly. Um, so in there, you'll find the standard kind of like save and save as options. Um, in the EDM menu, you can go back to your experiment list. Um, your account settings where you can change your passwords and you can log out. In the file menu, um, you've got your save and save as again. Um, you've got share, so that's how you share an experiment with another EDA users. So basically what that's going to do is that's going to make your experiment available to that user as a read-only version. Um, so if you update that experiment after saving, after sharing it, then the person that you shared it with will always have access to the up-to-date version, but they will not be able to update it themselves. Um, they'll be able to save it as something else, but they would not be able to change your experiment. Um, in that menu, you also have the options of exporting your um, diagram. So that exports an image of the diagram as a PDF or as an SVG image. So that's just an image that will not export all the information that's inside the nodes in the properties. Um, if you want to export everything but the diagram, including the properties, you've got to use export diagram data. So that's going to export your experiment as a, an EDA file that you can save locally and that you can share with whoever you want. Um, but then if you want to read it, you can have to re-import it into the EDA to read it. Um, so you'll have to open a blank canvas and then import that data to reload your diagram. Um, and then here you've got your standard edit menu. So that's pretty much what you will find in something like PowerPoint. Um, so you've got delete, cut, copy, paste, group, and group redo, undo. Um, so you can also use all the normal keyboard shortcuts to do that. Um, and I've shown the, uh, the view menu earlier, so you can zoom in, zoom out. Um, 
this one clear prompt will actually clear the prompts from the feedback. So see that little prompt that's left there. If I do clear prompt, that just removes it. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, so if anyone wants me to demonstrate anything else, I'm happy to do it. Is there any questions? All right, great. Yeah, we've had some questions come in, um, but feel free to also um, continue to ask questions as we go through the ones that have come in so far. Um, so we've had a couple of questions um, about um, the security of the tool. Um, you know, it's an online tool. Um, could you comment on the privacy of the data that's being put up? Um, so basically, I mean, the idea is the, sorry, the NC3Rs is a research funder. Um, and the type of information that you'd input into the EDA is actually very similar to the type of information that you put into a grant application. So we've actually used the same level of security. Um, and uh, we've had several um, consultants um, involved at every stage of the process to make sure that the EDA database was extremely secure. Um, no one is actually able to access your diagrams unless you share them specifically with you know, you know, me, for example. So you'd have to input my email address if you want to share a diagram with me. There's no other way that you, I could access any of the diagrams. So no one's accessing the diagram, no one's looking at them. Um, the, the information that's stored on the, um, on, on the server is very secure. We, we're actually checking the security of the server, including the physical security of the server on a regular basis. Uh, we're doing penetration testing on the system on a regular basis as well. Um, and despite all of this, if you actually didn't trust us, that's fine. You don't actually need to leave your experiment on the server. Um, so as I mentioned, the information that you're going to have to provide us to create an account is very, very limited. We just need an email address and a password. That doesn't need to be um, your institution email address, it could be anything. Um, and then when you create your experiment, you don't actually have to save it onto the server. You can just save it locally, as I mentioned, as I showed earlier, you can download the diagram data, save it locally as an EDA file, um, and then only upload it when you want to get feedback. Um, when you get feedback from the system, that's going to send information to the server, but that's actually not going to leave any footprint to the server. Um, so if you if you do it this way and don't store your experiments on the system, you don't you're not actually leaving any footprint there. All right, great. Um, so Tori asked um, what a diagram might look like um, if there were multiple outcomes in the experiment. If there are multiple outcomes, um, okay. Well, I can actually show this. Um, so depending on what you're doing. So here you're taking a measurement. We've recorded the plasma glucose levels. You could have another one there. Um, and you could say that that measurement, um, I don't know what else you could measure. Um, you could measure activity as well during that measurement. Um, so you could have it this way. Um, so now that you have two outcome measures, you're going to have to specify which one is the primary one. Um, so let's say that the glucose level are the primary one. Um, and then you're going to have to specify what you're going to do with the outcome measures, whether you know they're both going to be analyzed in the same analysis using a, a multivariate analysis, uh, sorry, not multivariate, but um, you know, the, the, the two um, outcome measures as part of the same analysis, or whether you're actually going to run different analyses for the two different outcome measures. So one might be your primary analysis and the primary outcome measure, and then you could indicate that you're actually going to run another secondary analysis, which is you know more exploratory. Um, so you've got analysis one and analysis two. Um, and then you need to get uh, what variables you want in this analysis. So drug might be a variable of interest in the second analysis as well. Um, so that's how you deal with it. You'd actually represent each outcome measures with this, with the different outcome measure node. Right, great. Um, Roy asked, does the system allow for the use of non-parametric analyses? Um, yes, so basically you're going to have to decide what you do. So when you get the suggestion for a method of analysis that's compatible with your design, you normally get the parametric analysis and it's non-parametric equivalent. Um, and, and we're trying to, um, we do recommend that you use parametric analysis because they're a lot more powerful. So basically we're just trying to help you, um, um, help you, um, make your data fit the parametric assumption and we provide a lot of advice on, on data transformation and so on. Um, and then if all of this fails, then you still have the non-parametric equivalent. Um, in some instances, the non-parametric equivalent does not exist. So there's nothing that you can do 
um, and you might have to do a rank transformation and still use parametric analysis. Um, but that's going to be a choice that you make, basically. We're providing you both options with a recommendation, and then you decide how you analyze your data. All right. Uh, so uh, Peter asked, um, what does the diagram look like for um, if you have a repeated measures factor? Um, OK, so I can show that as well. Um, so let me just move things around um, so that I can make bits of room. Right, OK. Um, so let's say, so this was measured as glucose level and activity. So instead of, um, so in, in there I've put a measurement note. Um, but I could actually have a repeated measurement node. So I can delete that node, select it, delete it. I'm just going to delete the arrows there. Um, and then from the node menu, as you can see, there's a different measurement node, and this one is a repeated measurement. Um, so it's just a slightly different node, basically. Um, and in there, in the property, you've got additional fields, and you have to indicate how many times you're repeating that measurement. Um, and when the measurement is done and the blinding and so on. So you can just use one of these nodes. Um, if time is available in your analysis, um, then you'll be asked to specify what is, um, you know, what are the different things that you're doing, what are the different timings. So the way that you'd indicate it, uh, if time was available in the analysis, let's say that you're going to repeat that on, you know, day one, day two, and day three, um, and you're going to analyze um, time as well. So you just add your timing so time, um, and then add your different timing that you're going to do your measurement at. So that could be day one. Um, actually, no, I can't call it day one. If I do this, I'm going to get some feedback from the diagram saying that I can't have different categories called the same way. Um, so I'm going to call it, uh, you know, measure one. And measure two, um, and I'll just indicate on my repeated measurement nodes that this is my repeated measurement. I've got two measures in this node, um, and that's going to be included as a variable in my analysis. So you would do it this way, and you could have a combination of you know simple measurement and then repeated measurements, for example. Um, the, if, if you only have two measurements, you could decide to be more explicit and rather than having a repeated measurement node, you could actually put two measurement nodes, so one following another. Um, so that's up to you. But there is a repeated measurement node to basically save space on the diagram if you're doing the same thing over and over again. All right. Um, so Ruby asked um, that she's going to be uh, teaching study design. Um, is, can this tool be used for teaching purposes? Yes, so it's actually been used um, a lot in that way already. Um, so basically, yes, it is really, really handy. Um, I've actually run a workshop with statisticians using the EDA, so teaching experimental design um, with you know, having a diagram on the screen to discuss all the different factors, all the different parameters that go into an experimental design, an experimental plan, and it's just really, really handy. Um, so yes, it can definitely be used that way. All right. Um, and then another question about kind of um, an alternative use of the tool. Um, do you think it would be useful at all to upload um, completed experiments to the tool to get some possible feedback on the experimental design that was used even after the fact? Um, well, you can, yeah, if you really want to do this, you can. Um, I'm not sure that's really going to be helpful. I mean, I'd much rather that people used it before they design an experiment um, because I think it's, yeah, it's just not going to be as helpful. Um, there's, there's no point knowing that you've done things wrong, actually. It's pretty better that you get the next experiment set up properly. All right. Um, and then we had a couple of questions related to the fact um, that some of the arrows say, um, you know, for um, uses animals or animal characteristics. Um, for researchers who are using the tool who aren't doing animal research, um, you know, we mentioned how they can just ignore the feedback. Um, but uh, Julio in particular was wondering, um, you know, if you know of anybody who has used the tool for non-animal research, submitted it to a funder, um, kind of saying, you know, just ignore where it says animals. And if there's 
you know, if the funder's been okay with that or has there been any confusion around that or, yeah. Okay, well, so I, the tool is fairly recent, so I don't know of any example of someone using, you know, um, doing human experiments and, and submitting an EDA diagram as part of it. Um, the, the short answer is no, you can't turn it off. Um, that's part of the ontology, so that would have to be adapted if you were to do a system for human research. Um, so you're just going to have to consider that humans are big animals. All right, great. Um, so I think that was uh, most of the main questions. Um, thank you so much, uh, Natalie, for doing this guest webinar for us. Um, thank you all for participating in the webinar. Um, and as I mentioned, we will hope to have the video posted to the Center for Open Science YouTube channel um, in a few weeks. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much. I hope it was useful.